Or yeah, I'll do it. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. yeah? Okay, great. It's here. What'd you say?
this inaugural season. And I am Terry Reeve, I'm with the Department of Media Study. Uh, this lecture series also runs in conjunction with a class. So I just want to signal to those of you in the class that uh, today you're turning in your interview assignments. I've been seeing some of them already. They're really exciting. It's really fun to listen to you and see your faces and experiment in this way. So please um, be sure to get those submitted if you have any technical problems getting those links posted or getting your files uploaded, please contact me as soon as possible. Um, tonight we have a special guest, which, um, who uh, Paige Sarlin will be introducing, and um, I'll give the floor to my colleague Paige Sarlin, also from the Department of Media Studies. She performed last Friday uh, with her collaborator as Disorientalism. And so you have fresh off the press photograph uh, documentation of that performance if you weren't lucky enough to see it on Friday down at the Education Opportunity Center. So I'm just gonna scroll through them while I read her bio. Um, so Catherine Behar, if I can do that. Um, so Catherine Behar is an interdisciplinary new media and performance artist and is assistant professor of new media at Baruch College in New York. Her artwork spans interactive installation, performance art, public art, photography, and video art to explore contemporary digital culture. Her projects mix low and high technologies, creating hybrid forms that are by turns humorous and sensuous. Behar's artwork has been presented internationally at venues including UNACTU in Dresden, Germany, the Brett, uh, Mediations Biennial in Poland, Moscow Biennial Special Projects, the Digital Live Arts Festival in Leeds, and the Swiss Institute in Rome, Italy. Nationally, she is exhibited at numerous galleries and venues including the Feldman Gallery and Project Space in Portland, Maryland Art Place in Baltimore, Art Space West in Phoenix, Diverse Works in Houston, and O Cinema in Miami. In New York, Behar's work has appeared at venues and galleries including Judson Memorial Church, Canada, Leslie Heller Workspace, The Big Screen Project, Galapagos, and Monkey Town, and at festivals including Conflux, The Affect Factory, and the Dumbo Art Under the Bridge Festival. Behar's ongoing collaborative projects include Disorientalism, a multimedia performance collaboration with Marianne M. Kim, and Resimplement. Is that, a, is that how you think? Okay. An experimental art and technology team with Ben Chang and Sylvia Ruzenka. Um, Disorientalism, as I said before, presented their multimedia performance entitled Brown Bagging. This past weekend is part of Techne Institute's Performing Economies Colloquium that was organized by Stephanie Rothenberg, Associate Professor of Visual Studies and assisted by me, Paige Sorlin. Um, in addition to her creative work, Behar writes on topics pertaining to embodiment and technology, cyborgian ethics, emerging and obsolete technologies, and feminist media culture. Her writing has been published in Lateral, Mediations, oh, Media N, Parsons, Journal for Information Mapping, Visual Communication Quarterly, Extensions, the online journal for embodied technology, and in conference proceedings for digital art and culture and cyber worlds. She is currently working on an exhibition catalog for And Another Thing, the 2011 exhibition she co-curated with Emmy Michelson at the James Gallery at Cooney Graduate Center in New York, which is forthcoming from Punctum Books. And she also has a, a solo show coming up at the um, Tuku, if 
sorry, Tuska, sorry, Tuska Center for Contemporary Art in Lexington, Kentucky in the fall entitled E-Waste. Behar serves as the Digital Fellow at Art Journal and is a Baruch Faculty Fellow at the Rubin Museum of Art. She was the founding artist and organizer at the Spare Room, a Time Arts co Cooperative in Chicago. And she um, has, her work has been supported by numerous art grants and awards. Uh, Behar received an MFA in combined media from the Department of uh, Art at Hunter College, and she holds an MA in media ecology from the Department of Media, Culture, and Communication at New York University. She also holds a BFA in studio art from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. So it is with great pleasure that I invite Kathleen Behar. share with you um, some of my art projects in which I'm engaging with everyday and surreal bits and pieces from technoculture. So I'm going to be moving back and forth between um, showing you some images and video, uh, playing some video, and also reading a little bit. Uh, but before getting started, uh, as this is a class, um, Paige had asked me to provide you with a couple of readings. And while the main focus tonight, I promise, is going to be on artwork, um, I did want to take maybe like the first 10 minutes to try to, first of all, provide a little bit of a broader context for what I do, and I'm also going to make an effort to tie in some of those readings. Um, so the three essays that I selected were Boredom by Siegfried Krakauer, which is from 1924, Postscript on Control Society by Gilles Deleuze from 1992, and What Is It Like to Be a Bat by Thomas Nagel from 1974. So I realized as I was going over my notes last night that in an effort for, to go for a historical breadth, I ended up giving you three white guys, which I'm a little sorry for. <laughs> but each of these pieces, I think, um, points to a theme in my artwork with, um, where I'm dealing with technology. So here we go. First, Deleuze suggests that the social conditions structuring my artwork take their cues from the very technologies that I'm making art about, both their inner workings and their outer objectives. As Deleuze writes, quote, types of machines are easily matched with each type of society, not that machines are determining, but because they express those social forms capable of generating them and using them. So we can understand something about the social conditions of our lives by examining, as Deleuze does so prophetically, how machines disseminate qualitative affordances in social experience. And this is important for me because these textures and gestures are the stuff of my art. Next, Krakauer asserts that boredom is a gesture of resistance to spectacle. Abstaining from all of the gossamer glamour that's shelled out by media, boredom reinvests interest into what I call the ugly bits, bits that are presumed worthless in an attention economy. In my art, I'm interested in diverting attention toward boring, overlooked, and overworked devices. Krakauer makes a further interesting point. Quote, who would want to resist the invitation of those dainty headphones? They gleam in living rooms and entwine themselves around heads all by themselves. And instead of fostering cultivated conversation, which certainly can be a bore, 
One becomes a playground for worldwide noises that, regardless of their own potentially objective boredom, do not even grant one's modest right to personal boredom. When I read this, I always think that Krakauer is channeling a future vision of a subway car filled with commuters whose dainty, innocent earbuds have, of their own volition, entwined themselves around every available head like a tentacled cyborg kudzu vine. For me, the real takeaway here is that humans aren't necessarily the active subjects of technology. If we relinquish our anthropocentric biases, we can see machines as subjects of technology and humans as technology's objects. From the point of view of your headphones, you just provide a head to rest on or ears to nuzzle in and nothing more. In the third essay, Nagel attempts a kind of sympathetic perspective swap of his own when he seeks to set aside his human viewpoint and understand a bat's experience. In other words, he's trying to understand an experience that is entirely foreign to his own. Merely imagining a bat's behaviors, he warns, quote, tells me only what it would be like for me to behave as a bat behaves. But that is not the question. I want to know what it is like for a bat to be a bat. The closest we can come is using our imagination. But our imagination is always grounded in our subjective experience. The bottom line is that we don't have access to a bat's experience of being a bat. Bats are sealed off and closed to us. We could say that bats are black boxed, and I'll come back to this. Nagel challenges us, quote, to form new concepts and devise a new method, an objective phenomenology not dependent on empathy or imagination that would describe at least in part the subjective character of experiences in a form comprehensible to beings incapable of having those experiences. Although Nagel rejects empathy and imagination, as an artist, I rely on these very techniques to understand objects radically different from myself and experiences radically different from my own. Like Nagel, I think that stretching toward without colonizing radical difference is a critical task. For me, this also carries an ethical dimension and a special urgency today, given the homogenizing effects of digital ubiquity. Now, that could be a little bit uh, imposing or intimidating. Uh, they could also be really cute. I put this slide in for Stephanie. Uh, <laughs> but the truth is that I am not really interested in what it is like to be that. Instead, I want to know what it is like to be a mouse. And I don't mean this kind of mouse. I want to know what it is like to be this kind of mouse, really. So in my work, I employ empathy and imagination to try to understand mice and the like. It's partly an ethical gesture to understand these radically different inanimate companion species, and partly an effort to lift the veil of mystery surrounding technologies and take tech down off of its pedestal a little bit. So I just suggested that bats are black box. And indeed, the idea of cracking open a black box is key to this. As you may know in engineering, black boxes are devices or systems that have an input and an output, but their internal workings are hidden from view. So basically, there's an interface that you can interact with, but you can't see what's going on behind it. A bat is like a black box in that we only have access to the way it presents itself to us, never to its internal experience of self. A black box technology, likewise, is a sealed off technology. It's opaque. So in tech, what black boxes do is they hide a process. The Play-Doh spaghetti factory is a great example. You put Play-Doh in and you get noodles out but you don't have or need any special knowledge of the mechanisms and processes required for the production of noodles. If you're in the Play-Doh business, you just take the noodles and go with it. So sometimes a technology is literally sealed where you can't or are not allowed to open it. These are black boxes that don't allow tampering. 
On the left is a black box flight recorder from a plane, and on the right is a black box technology where if you open it up, you've just voided your warranty. So these are black, uh, black boxes that you can't open. Other times, a technology is hidden from view in a more abstract way, in that its processes are something that you just take for granted. For the philosopher Martin Heidegger, that was the definition of a tool. He said that a tool was something that you take for granted until it stops working. And then it's not a tool anymore, it's a broken tool. So why is this important? Contemporary digital technologies are really easy to take for granted, both because we are reliant on them for so many things that it would be almost impossible to sort of pause and recognize them at every step of the way and because of two cultural values that are engineered into digital technologies, miniaturization and acceleration. Technologies are becoming too small and too fast to notice. So this is a 60 gigahertz wireless HD chipset that will let you use your smartphone to play 3D games in full HD on your big screen TV. And it will be so small that it will fit into your phone and so fast that there's gonna be no signal lag. So you won't even know that it's there. So these are the kinds of black boxes that I want to open up. And the tool that I use, my black box can opener, so to speak, is performance art. Through my performances, I try to open up black box technologies in two ways. First, I expand them physically to enlarge what is miniature. I try to up the scale to make them body sized. And second, I expand them temporally to draw out what is accelerated. I try to give time and attention to that black box process. Basically, I am taking things that are small and fast and making them big and slow. Whether it escapes, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm skipping here. So I'm drawing attention, when I'm doing this, I'm drawing attention to the physical embodied presence of black box technologies and to the time and labor that go into their processes, both of which it's very easy to overlook. Whether a black box uh, technology escapes notice or is literally sealed shut, when a technology is black boxed, its process is mystified. And what I want to do with my art is to try to approach technology in a way that works against mystification, that encourages people to not take it for granted. I want to open up black boxes and see what's really going on in there. Now, as I've studied technologies over the years, what I consistently find is that Black boxes hide what I like to call the ugly bits. The ugly bits are all of the parts of a technology that we prefer not to see. Even the idea that techno culture has ugly bits, that it's not all roses, is another explanation for the prevalence of black boxes. We use them to hide unflattering aspects of technologies and of our relationships to them. So I'll be returning to this theme tonight how we might use art to inspect the unflattering aspects of tech. Now, because my work is largely about undermining technology, I can think of no better way to begin than by putting my computer to sleep and really starting this talk by talking over a screensaver. So if we could bring the house lights down, thank you. So, wow, really dark, okay. Um, People usually assume that because I'm a new media artist, I must love new technologies. But really, most of my art is a response to how alienated I feel by digital culture. So in my artwork, I'm trying to hack my day-to-day -day encounters with technology to change my experiences to center around empathy or connectedness. I figure that if I'm going to share my world with digital technologies, we'd better become friends. So when I'm prying open a black box, it's also kind of a getting to know you gesture. I'm trying to introduce myself to the technology and the technology to my audience. And I often employ humor as an icebreaker. The work that you're looking at right now is a screensaver that I made called Pipe Cleaner. It's a fully functional cross-platform screensaver and you can download it from my website. I used 3D Pipes, an old Microsoft Windows screensaver from the late 90s as the setting. And I made this sort of post-feminist intervention by inserting a pole dancer into the growing maze of pipes. 
She's wearing a dress that's made out of cleaning gloves. And in addition to dancing, she's trying to clean and polish the pipes. So she's doing the same kind of maintenance work that the software does, in that both are trying to keep your screen in good condition. However, the pipe cleaning pole dancers' spins and gyrations are edited in the same kind of absurd recombinant logic as the screensaver, and she's continuously being tracked and overwritten by the pipes. So, I'm gonna stop this for a second. No, we're not. Okay, we're gonna let it go. Um, another important element of this piece is that it is a screensaver. Unlike most artwork, it is not meant for humans to look at. It's really for the machine. A screensaver is an ugly bit in that it is something that plays on your screen when you've stepped away from your computer. At best, you might see it out of the corner of your eye. It's designed for you to ignore, not to stare at. In writing about this project, curator Jillian Hernandez said, Quote, by reinserting the race and gendered body back into the original screensaver, Behar exposes the ways in which digital technologies are pervasively coded as masculine. So the screensaver is the black box in this work, and what it hides is the ugly bit of an unspoken gender imbalance. By opening up that black box, and this piece is almost saying, surprise, look who's inside, I'm trying to expose that gender imbalance and make it explicit. In the process of making this piece, I learned that in the 19th century, prostitution in the US was discussed through a rhetoric of hygiene. So sex workers, like the pole dancer, were seen as a way of keeping men's dirty vices out of the home, like flushing all of the dirty stuff out. So pipes and plumbing were already gendered long before Microsoft's 3D pipes. Pipe Cleaner is an overtly feminist project, and a lot of my work tries to counter alienation by domesticating technology. So I'm literally entering the black box and trying to inhabit the machine, which is my approach in the next piece that I want to show you, a project where I perform as a computer bug. Here, the black box process that I'm trying to open um, is a process in computer code, and the ugly bit that I find there is a logical error. In the spirit of friendship, performing computer bugs is sort of a variation on the walk a mile in another man's shoes adage. In this project, it's something like run a cycle in another machine's algorithm. So debugging loop-de-loop -loop consists of five very short micro video loops exploring the infinite loop bug. These photos are from an installation of the videos in a show called Turnstile at Interval in Manchester, England. In an infinite loop, a logical error causes a portion of a computer program to repeat itself endlessly, thereby preventing the program from running through to completion. I used a hula hoop and VHS videotape to create a recursive and solipsistically silly system for five bug behaviors. Performing a mating dance, defecation, spinning a cocoon, consumption, and flying. So I'm gonna play the videos and I'm warning you, they're small and fast. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> okay, so I got the idea for performing computer bugs when a friend showed me this image of the so-called first computer bug, a moth that was found by Admiral Grace Murray Hopper, this is her, um, inside of the Navy's Mark II computer. Hopper is known as the mother of COBOL because she invented the COBOL programming language, and she also wrote the first compiler, which is a program that converts programmers code written in higher level languages into machine code or ones and zeros, and it's a completely indispensable tool for programmers working today. So legend has it that Hopper debugged the machine by literally taking the bug out of it and sort of scotch taping it into her logbook. So you can see here it says um, uh, at 1545, relay number 70 panel F, moth in relay, first actual case of bug being found. 
So I find this image enchanting. I love that from this non-human animal perspective of the bug, the computer is physical architecture. It's a place as good as any to live. So the ugly bit of a bug opens the black box because it can fit inside and get in there and look around. Shifting perspectives magically hacks our relationship to computers. So while bugs are unintentional mistakes in code, there are other kinds of ugly bits that are coded into technologies by design for better or worse. And in the next piece, I want to show you, I'm putting my body on the line, the command line, if you will, to try my hand at doing the work that a computer does when it's mixing color. Color mixing on a computer is a terribly arcane, uninteresting activity. It's one of those things that might be better off left in the black box. So in this project, I tried to reimagine that esotericism in an attempt to make the process compelling and even maybe a little bit mystical. So this project is called Hext, and I perform as a cybernetic sorceress who divines color by typing. Hext refers both to the German word Hexen, which means to use black magic, and to hexadecimal codes, which are six-digit alphanumeric codes used, among other things, for determining color on websites. I use a red divining rod and a projected red laser keyboard, and a computerized voice repeats the letters and numbers as I type them. And when I'm typing are commands that determine the color of a projection aimed back over my body. I wanted to go kind of back to basics with this project. And I was thinking about how being an artist in some sort of fundamental traditional sense means being the one who is in control of color. Thinking about color theory and color mixing for painters and how this is a process that's magical and scientific and cryptic all at the same time. And I was thinking about typing as a fundamental activity for computer users, how before the GUI was the command line. And then I was also thinking about the idea of fingers typing and about the digit, this finger digit, right, um, in the digital. And I was thinking that if you imagine, I don't know if you can even see this in the dark here, but if you can imagine fingers typing at a keyboard and then you take away the keyboard, it looks like someone casting a magic spell. So um, here is some video of the performance. C, C. I'm not the first woman to embody being a computer. And in fact, before computers were computers, computers were women. In the 1940s, before all of this miniaturization, a computer wasn't a thing, it was a job. So computers were people who performed computation. Bakers bake, computers compute. So computing was monotonous number crunching, a form of clerical work that was usually done by women both because there were more women available during World War II um, in the workforce, and because of cultural assumptions that women were more suited to this kind of mindless tedium. So this image shows two women computers working on the ENIAC machine, the first general purpose electronic computer. And this somewhat stunning image shows a male programmer issuing commands to a female computer. So, my work is carrying on in this tradition, recognizing the material historical connection between working bodies and the computer. And one of the things that I'm most concerned with that black boxes hide is the labor required for that black box process to run. Drawing attention to the hands-on performative aspect of computing 
is a way of preserving agency and physicality for people working in industrial and post-industrial systems. What these images show is that there's a feminist concern here too. There is a direct connection between the invisible black boxed labor of the machine and the invisibility of women's work. And here we could think back to the idea of how the screensaver's maintenance work is not meant for our eyes. This connection to women's technologized work is a main theme for disorientalism, an interdisciplinary collaboration between myself and Marianne and Kim. We've been working together on this project since 2005, and our work includes public performances, videos, lenticular photography, an interactive book, a video game, and much, much more. In all of our projects, we study the disorienting effects of technologized labor, throwaway junk culture, and consumerism. Disorientalism is a made-up word, but we're sending a shout out to Edward Said's famous book, Orientalism, in which he talked about how identifying the other is a way of orienting one's power for those in power. For us, not in power, Identifying is a hop, skip, and a jump away from mistaken identity. It's got the potential to be deeply disorienting. We think of our identities as what we produce and consume and what produces and consumes us at all times. So it's constantly getting mixed up. Um, this is a short clip from a video by Disorientalism called Plugging Away. And it's a piece that's dealing with labor and the play between the natural and the man-made. This is an excerpt from a longer video. Um, so this is an early project of disorientalisms, and we've made quite a bit of work over the years. But tonight I'll show you just one more piece, fast forwarding to the current series that we're working on, the food groups, and the work that we were showing um, this past weekend. So the food groups is a series of five installations about erasing the distinction between the depersonalized production and the very personalized promotion of industrial food. We are assuming the identities of these five characters from mid-century American mass-produced food. Wendy of Wendy's Old Fashioned Hamburgers, Aunt Jemima, the Lando Lakes Indian Maiden, the Sun Made Raisin Girl, and Chiquita Banana. Um, this is our installation brown bagging about Wendy. And our performance on Friday, Quality is Our Recipe, is part of this series. In the installation, the room is filled with over 600 hand-stamped brown paper bags, and cacophonous sound from a lot of media is playing simultaneously. The centerpiece of the installation is Participation May Vary, an interactive Connect video game that we made in collaboration with game designers Chanzenka. And there are three short videos also playing in the background. This piece is about the gamification of labor, in which, through play, one accomplishes work that can be capitalized upon for profit. We were interested in the confusion between the affective labor of play and the physical labor of factory work. And we wanted to show that affective labor, which means labor that produces feelings instead of commodities, is also physical. So in the game, you work in Wendy's brown bag factory, but instead of doing the repetitive tasks associated with boring factory work, like flipping burgers or checking widgets, you have to do all of the fun repetitive tasks that are codified in gaming, things like jumping again and again, or picking things up over and over. 
and in between shifts, lest you become too tired to be a productive worker, you have to learn Tai Chi to relax and restore your energy level so that you're ready to work your next shift. So um, this is, I'm gonna sort of talk over this video. Um, this is a, a gameplay capture from the video game. So it starts off and you have to jump and as you're jumping, you're bouncing and vibrating the bags off of the factory floor. And wait, let me see if I can let my mouse over here. There we go. Um, and so you keep doing this. And then um, in the second level, you have to learn Tai Chi. So you get to go outside, it's beautiful, it's nice out, you can restore yourself. Um, and you have these red dots on your hands and feet that are showing up and they, um, you have to line them up with the red dots that are appearing in, in um, in the video, and hopefully this gets, this seems easy, but it's actually a little bit hard. Um, so in the, you're you're uh, getting yourself into the proper Tai Chi pose. Um, in the next level, you are gleaning. Um, and gleaning is this way of picking up waste from um, from a harvest or from now industrial harvest. Um, but in our version, instead of picking up fallen tomatoes off of the tomato plants, you're picking up. Um, ketchup balls. Um, once you've finished your Tai Chi, uh, or sorry, your uh, gleaning, you have to do more Tai Chi. Um, and this idea with the red dots was also that we, the t red dot is both your chi ball of energy and also your, um, one of Wendy's freckles, it's a price sticker at one point, it's a, it's a splurt of ketchup so there's, there's a lot of uh, things that we're working on with, with these red dots in the video. Um, and then the red dot goes even further in the last, oops, the last level, um, the red dot becomes a Katamari ball. And in this level, the idea is it's a takeoff of Katamari and you are um, rolling up all of these things that are in the factories. You're rolling up the, the bags, the, um, the ketchup bottles, extra work aprons, um, and then ultimately you end up um, sort of rolling up parts of the architecture. So the idea is that eventually you roll up the entire factory and break free from your uh, from your uh, miserable working existence. <laughs> um, and once you do break free, um, you end up uh, sort of in this black void, which is Nirvana. So okay. <laughs> um, some, some folks were able to play this game um, on Friday. So um, there were also three video loops in this installation. Um, the first one is Biggie, in which we contend with a very big bag. Everyday Value, in which we glean ketchup bottles in a tomato hothouse. And Deluxe Double, which I'll play for you now, in which we're trying to tame our unruly chi energy. Here's Deluxe Double. So in my work with disorientalism, we appropriate from junk culture. And one thing that this collaboration has taught me 
is to look at all artifacts of technoculture as mass-produced junk. High-tech junk is just junk that enters circulation at a higher price point than the junk you find in the 99 cent store or the junk food in Wendy's value meal. Tech junk is easier identif to identify as clean old junk when it becomes obsolete. Engineering missteps and design faux pas clog the arteries, litter the hallways, and cram the circuits of commercial desire. It is easy enough to despise the digital dross of so much junk culture, but insofar as we reflect ourselves in the products we create and love to hate, fabricating new technologies to overcome our human limitations, and retrofitting ourselves to accommodate their inevitable shortcomings, we engage in a cycle of mutual imprinting. And so we must ask, as we code ourselves into technology, bit for bit, what becomes of the ugly bits? Are they augmented along with the rest? One such ugly bit lurking in the dynamic of user tool servitude is the possibility that our distaste masks residual class prejudice. Are not digital tools the inanimate, ununionized, exploited working class global capitalist production. Programmed to perform uncomplainingly in always on 24 seven work weeks, today's software and hardware legions carry out the modernist dream of robotic forced labor. High obsolescence rates betray our disregard for the, these machines, which in another world we might know as companion species. Though we are eager to accept their servitude, we are quick to discard them for a faster, stronger, newer model. Have we displaced slavery and its disposable corpus of mass labor into the object world? These would be questions for science fiction were it not for commercial cycles unprecedented acceleration, which does not only collapse production and consumption or merely garble labor and leisure, Today, there is no clear division between producer and product. When self is a product of media and consumed as media, we can see how our own selves as media are ripe for exploitation too, through digital profiling, tracking, tagging, etc. When we too are media, the imperative to inculcate care for consumer technologies sounds only half funny. The next piece that I'd like to show you talks about generational overturn in planned obsolescence by enacting a non-human love affair between two machines. This is 3G56K. It's an interactive technology and performance installation. I made a 12-foot iPhone with a functioning touch screen that performers and or audience members could dance or walk around on and dial numbers. So when you dialed a number, the signal would travel through this really big black rubber hose over to the iPhone's love interest, which was a dial-up modem inside this big pink tower computer. The modem would then place the call and print out a page of the facts, producing a long scrolling image of the rubber hose. Um, so here's a short video of the installation.
this piece is really an intergenerational love affair between a contemporary iPhone and an obsolete dial-up modem. And just like my own phone, iPhone, which at the time liked wearing black leather, these machines are dressed in fetish wear. They've got lots of vinyl and rubber and zippers. So an important part of this piece is that the humans in this relationship are reduced to the role of fluffers, who just are there to try to get the machines to connect. This is really a user-unfriendly interface that isn't designed with humans in mind, because without numbers on the screen, people are dialing blind. And in fact, there was a lot of crank calling. Every time a nonsense number was dialed, the number redirected to Apple headquarters. Um, and a beautiful sort of unplanned aspect of this project was that when you call Apple, a human doesn't answer the phone. It's a computer. So there was a frustrated conversation going on between the two computers where Apple's automated voice directory system kept trying and failing to get a response from 3G56K. And Apple's computerized voice kept saying things like, I'm sorry, I'm having a hard time understanding you. Ordinarily, machines do the biddings of humans. And here I'm trying to remedy that kind of ugly bit by putting humans in the service of machines. It's a role reversal to give the machines a break. I wanted to extend solidarity toward ugly bit machines, doomed to working forever on our behalf. And I want to commemorate the unsung toil of dial-up modems, the forgotten pains of color codes, the uncomplaining servitude of screensavers, and the, neglect the neglected, taken-for-granted reliability of not bats, but mice. My current project, E-Waste, is a sculptural series of half-fossilized mutant USB devices. I'll exhibit this series next fall at the Tusca Center for Contemporary Art in Kentucky. Digital culture demands unprecedented and ever-escalating productivity. And a lot of attention goes into new um, exploitations of human labor, as when old forms of human labor are captured as data. But this also includes machines' innate productive capacities. For example, our digital tools induce us to work at constantly entertaining our social networks, or they continue producing data for us, even while politely zipped away. And these devices themselves are constantly working, mirroring the thankless labor of caregivers and support staff everywhere. They are always on. Hyperproductivity results in gross overaccumulation, a glut in consumer media artifacts to parallel the, surface, the surplus in big data. These works also accentuate a second result of hyperproductivity and accumulation, its environmental impact. This is an especially ugly bit. E-waste suggests that cheap throwaway USB artifacts will outlive humans. Zombie-like, the fans will keep churning, the LEDs stay lit. But it's important to state that these pieces are not dystopic. They show moments of material intimacy that simply doesn't include human protagonists. These clusters and clumps confirm how affinities flow between objects and environment. In a non-human afterlife, the built environment swarms and secures the body of orphaned devices. The next project that I want to show you takes a slightly different vein. And I still am um, showing how and indeed that computers work. But here in a very literal sense, I'm looking at bits and looking at the way that ugly bits might also be beautiful. So um, Compositions for Bit is an interactive art concert commemorating Bit, the first CGI movie character from Disney's 1982 classic, Tron. In this piece, I'm again envisioning the inner life of machines, but this time I wanted to take the audience there too by making it interactive and immersive, like stepping into the game grid in Tron and seeing firsthand the kind of labor that goes into flipping bits and exchanging electrical charges. Compositions for Bit was performed in 2010 at Judson Church in New York on the day before the sequel, Tron Legacy, came out in theaters. But it's the culmination of a long-standing obsession that I had with Bit. So this is Bit, um, who is an animated polyhedron who becomes 
Jeff Bridges' pet, kind of, and bobs around his head saying yes or no. Okay, so you get the idea, it kind of keeps going. Um, so in Compositions for Bit, I created three larger than life sculptures of Bit, and inside of each shape there was a dancer who's wearing a costume that I designed with embedded Wii mode sensors. The sensors allow the dancer's movements to control sound and video projections. And I invited three composers, Suzanne Thorpe, Shelley Bergen, and Sylvia Ruzanka, to use these bits, meaning the unit of the shape, the dancer, and the Wii mode, as musical instruments, and ask them to make compositions for the bits to play as they flip by rolling around the room. So this was a concert with three movements, one by each composer. Each shape also had a fisheye, a wireless fisheye camera inside, so audience could see the dancers either by peering into the windows of the shapes or by watching video feeds that were projected on the three screens hanging from the balcony. And I was live mixing those video projections um, and blending the dancers' real-time feeds with footage from the movie and from the arcade game. Um, so it's important to mention, after this kind of uh, slightly in-depth technical explanation, that when you were in the space, uh, whoops, sorry. Um, when you were in the space, you weren't necessarily aware of all of the technical things that were going on. It was a holistic, um, immersive experience for the audience. So. Um, Bit, for me, is exceptional for two reasons. First of all, the first CGI movie character is kind of cool. But second, Bit taps into a moment when computers existed more as fantasy than as reality in our culture. So if you think about it, Tron came out two years before the 1984 release of the Apple Macintosh, which popularized the graphical user interface. So Tron was imagining a visual spatial language for computing before there actually was one. Tron was making things up, and that allowed for some weirdness to slip in. Specifically, most people today associate bits with binary logic, so uh, two states, one or zero, yes or no. But um, you'll notice that in Tron, bit has three states, yellow, red, and blue, for yes, no, and maybe, or something, right? Whether or not you think that that's an ugly bit, it's definitely the case of an undecided or illogical bit, and that was quite inspiring to me. So we're nearing the end here, and I'd like to conclude with two site-specific performances in which rather than delve into the machine, I'm bringing a structural aspect of technology, uh, <coughs> what curator Lisa Tenenbaum has called its technics into real space. So, oops, what happened here? Okay, there we go. Um, Building Blocks is a piece that I made for an exhibition called Camouflage in Dresden in 2008. This is a, a piece about this building, the Zentrum Barn House, which was a department store located in the Progerstrasse and was an example of international style socialist architecture from the DDR. In 2007, the building was raised to make way for a shopping mall. This is a common fate for socialist era buildings in East Germany, and it's an emotionally charged issue for many Germans. This building in particular was a focal point for Dresdeners, and the street, the Progerstrasse, was the first complete project for the DDR architects, where they sort of had the ability to design the entire thing and put in the hotels and the stores and the fountains and all of it. So some, despite this, tearing down buildings like this one, is happening all over East Germany. Some see all things that are associated with the DDR as mediocre and want to replace them in the interest of moving on to a bright new future. And others view this as a form of cultural erasure and an unacceptable suppression of Germany's socialist past. Dresden was firebombed by the Allies during World War II, and the center of the city was totally destroyed. Recently, within the last 15 years, they have rebuilt the historic center as an exact replica of its former self. So this Baroque church was completed, despite all appearances, in 2005. This is a complex issue, but there is a value statement in choosing to, rep to present a Baroque face for a city instead of a socialist one. 
In Building Blocks, I worked with four local dancers who inhabited silver shapes that I had modeled on elements from the missing building's distinctive aluminum facade. The four traumatized fragments of the building briefly reconvened at the construction site, momentarily attempted to reassemble themselves, and eventually dispersed and rolled away along the length of the Pragerstrasse to the exhibition site. With this project, I was thinking about the idea of phantom limb, the idea that when a patient has had a limb amputated, they sometimes have a sensation that their missing body part is still there. So this is bad enough if you were the patient, but can you imagine being the limb, right? So you're like, you need somebody to scratch you when you're lying in a bio waste uh, disposal place somewhere, I don't know, right? So this is bad. Um, and I was thinking that these hive shapes are in many ways like the Centrum Barn House's phantom facade. They were ripped off of the, the building's body and became disoriented and lonely and tried to find their way back. But the familiarity they're seeking has long been destroyed. Uh, this past summer, I was invited to revisit this project in a new context, uh, a public art show in downtown Manhattan about areas that were hit by Hurricane Sandy. I imagined that I would find construction sites and buildings in disrepair, speaking to a similar kind of vulnerability of the city. But when I visited the sites nine months after the hurricane, nearly everything was fully repaired, and Wall Street's formidable architecture showed no trace of trauma. At 32 Old Slip, I noticed an orange jersey barrier, which struck me as a sort of paltry, futile defense mechanism, and it became the inspiration for the performance, which I titled Streets Walling In. Although the barrier was meant to reinforce the building's perimeter, it had the opposite effect, recalling the precarious past moments like 9-11, Sandy, and Occupy. I made orange shapes inspired by the Jersey Barrier segments, each containing a dancer. Over two and a half hours, they traversed the building's perimeter from the East River to the barrier on the northwest corner of the building. The performance concludes with the shapes amassing in the barrier's furthermost nook, as though coming home to roost. One of the things that I'm really interested in with computer bugs and errors is how they're like the repressed trauma that haunts a seemingly pristine and seemingly unstoppable technological success story. These are the ugly bits. I think that the same thing goes on with the desire to reshape a city's face by editing and rewriting chapters from its architectural history. And repairing a site beyond recognition amounts to paving over the memory of an uncertain time, a time when infallible systems fail or nature simply surprises us. This same short-term memory loss nullifies the trauma in upgrade culture. We are forgetting the importance of backward compatibility at a historical scale. And this idea of rewriting history or hacking history or prying open black boxes that historical or commercial forces have sealed shut, the effort to air the ugly bits is really what my work is all about. So thank you. <laughs> Just threw a lot at you. You can digest for a second. Can you say how long the USB objects? They're all, they all actually have uh, uh, USB things inside them. So like the one that has the two mics in it is about this big. Um, those black ones are based on, um, they have these laptop cooling platforms in them. So they're like about yay big. They're all uh, very um, sort of personally sized in a way. They, they feel like things that you can pick up and hold, so. Lucia. I think that I'm really interested in 
in exactly that, right? In technologies that are either on the cusp or that are dredged up from the past, you know? And the reason is that I think that it's easiest to apprehend technologies at one of those two points, right? That you either are confronted by the strange and new, and you have to try to re, like wrap your mind around this. This is becoming, um, you know, less and less the case. Um, or you see something that is that the materiality of that object often with obsolete technologies is probably why I gravitate towards the obsolete ones. Is that the materiality is so um, intense and tangible, right? Um, and that that lets you um, have access to the technology as an object. You know, um, I think that there's a, a moment when a new technology is simply an object before you learn how to use it, right? You're kind of confronted with its strangeness and have to experience it as an object, like, where's the on switch? I don't know, you know, this kind of thing. So I'm interested in those two moments because it's a way of um, sort of emphasizing the materiality of, of these, these things that are too easy to overlook. I thought I'd hand over <coughs> this corner. Are you, no? Okay. Stretching. Okay. Yeah? Hi. Uh, I was wondering what are the insights to learn from the <coughs> Yeah, so the two, the jumping, the first level of the jumping is really just jumping, which is in every game, right? Um, the second one, the reference is Pikmin. Um, where you're picking up the, um, the ketchup bottles. So it's a game that is, you, you pick up these little, I don't even know what they are, they're Pikmin. They're like sprout guys, kind of. <laughs> so it's a similar, it's a similar thing. Almost no one gets that reference. <laughs> Our super, um, super geeky, nerdy uh, game designers were educating us about those two. Other? Other questions? Tony. Um, there's a, um, a way that people used to think about the world um, back before science, you know, where everything was inhabited. Well, the way we describe it now is everything's inhabited by demons, you know, like that, to explain why things fall down. You say, like, if it wants to fall to the ground, you know, there's something, a demon or something that's uh, a part of it that makes it want to fall to the ground. And all kinds of natural, uh, uh, what we call forces now, mm -hmm. which <laughs> I don't know if those are any more real, you know, but uh, what we call forces, they, they were explained and said by uh, animated uh, mm -hmm. ideas of, you know, sort of like a psychologizing of the world. And you're, I'm fascinated by the way you're psychologizing um, you know, like all kinds of objects and machines and so forth, and sort of flipping that, flipping that back in that direction. Um, and I'm just wondering if, yeah, like, did, were you born in 1500? <laughs> <laughs> it's entirely possible. <laughs> yeah, I, um, I've been reading a book recently that's called The Human Motor, um, and it talks, um, well, it covers a lot of ground. But one of, the, one of the things that's quite interesting to me is that I, I think maybe this is um, part of the shift that you're describing is that um, there, there's a sort of vitalist um, tradition of uh, these would be the forces, right? The spirit of the object or that there is life spirit everywhere and it shows up in us and things, right? Um, and then this kind of got in through modernity um, this was sort of overwritten by a mechanistic um, worldview. And I think it, this is really a tension in my work, right, where I, um, I, it's like I want to be a mechanist, but I'm secretly still a vitalist or something. That there are, I am still trying to think, okay, well, you know, what would it be like if these things were alive? You know, if bits were alive or if, um, and then maybe that is fundamentally disrespecting in the same way that, um, that Nagel was talking about the bat, right? Like, you, sorry, you can't know what it's like to be a bat. Sorry, I can't know what it's like for, to be a bit, right? Um, but I can try. <laughs> so, yeah. Shift classes, courses do you teach? 
<laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's a great question. So I teach in a very small program, and we offer um, ultimately very. Uh, our classes are um, a lot of introductory level courses. Um, I teach video. I teach and a course that I love teaching actually is the intro course um, for our minor. I teach sorry I teach at Baruch College in the Department of Fine and Performing Arts, and I run the New Media Arts um, minor there undergrad minor. So there's an intro course that sort of covers a little bit of everything, um, a little imaging, a little uh, moving image, a little sound, um, a little code, little, little code. Um, but I really love teaching because I think it, it um, expands uh, people's ideas and gives them a sense of where they want to go. I, I really enjoy working with students at that moment when you're kind of figuring out what you want to do next. Um, and then I also teach um, Let's see, I teach digital photography, I teach web design, I teach, um, at, the, at the other end of the spectrum, I teach a class that is our, the capstone class for the minor, where students do an exhibition. So it's really like an advanced studio class, and they put on a show, so, yeah. To ab abjection, okay. Um, I, I would say that the, um, so just definitionally, a black box is something that has an input and an output. And, and, and you, those are the interface, right? So I feel like bodies have very wide ranging interfaces, right? So I mean, we do have a, a mouth and an ass, but we also have, you know, so, like skin, right? We have like many, many ways to engage our bodies. Um, so I have a hard time um, seeing a connection between those. Um, I do think, you know, what you're talking about certainly that um, that we are often confused by our inner workings, right? That you know, or we don't, we are, don't. Um, understand our inner workings, right? Um, but at the same time, we are aware of our inner workings. And part of the black box, uh, you know, you, you have a stomach ache. You don't know why you have a stomach ache, but you definitely know you have a stomach ache, right? Um, so I think that um, part of what the black box does, actually, is it um, it numbs that, right? It, it sort of, it, it's a way of parceling this so that you don't have to think about it, right? And in terms of objection, I think that um, if anything, the black box in that in that function of um, sort of hiding a process or hiding something that's difficult to contend with or making the experience of it um, simpler and easier, that a black box might work against objection. But I, I haven't really taken it much thought. So that's so off the cuff answer. Um, I have two questions. The first one has to do with the, uh, the little, the ugly bits. <laughs> Wow, the two of you. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that is that is a, a tension in the same way that the the vitalism uh, mechanist uh, thing is a tension as well. I think um, you know, I I think 
ugly fits maybe um, there it's more uh, ideological, right? That it's um, I mean it in a sense of not being not that it's a thing that's physically ugly, but more that ideologically um, these are things that um, don't work well with our our uh, you know sort of consumerist impulses with technology. So. I'm trying to kind of, um, on one hand, just find those things, right, um, and show them. And on the other hand, I am trying to um, to sort of extend care, you know. And if that involves, um, I've never, I haven't really thought about this before, but I think that if that involves a kind of um, like aesthetic elevation um, of some of these subject matters, then that might be. Part of that impulse is that I am trying to sort of um, like find these things that get you know like there's it's like the underdogs right I want to like elevate the underdogs you know and maybe doing that aesthetically is, is what I'm working on now. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I'm not really a nerd anymore, <laughs> uh, but uh, back in the day, um, I I did some computer programming really early on and stuff like that. And one of the things that's really striking is the amount of aesthetics <coughs> that, <coughs> that, that nerds get involved in. You know, mm -hmm. like uh, math, the math uh, people, they always talk about the beauty of, yeah. a, of a theorem or of a proof, yeah. and, uh, and then also devising a, a, a computer program if it's really elegant. They think that's really beautiful. And so there, it's a kind of bizarre uh, 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 driving energy that's predominantly aesthetic, mm -hmm. I think, in a lot of these things that that are usually thought of as being ugly and mechanical and you know sort of like um, I probably I bet half the people here um, know exactly what I'm talking about, or maybe all of them. Yeah, because uh, they say it's truth, but it's not uh, truth. It's actually beauty. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's true, actually. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's a, yeah, definitely an underlying facet. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. One plus one is usually two. <laughs> yeah. If you get it to be three, whoa. I'm sorry, that's I, a comment. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I think it's a, it is a, a good comment. It reminds me of a um, really early piece of, of, that I worked on um, where I was thinking about, this is, now I'm dating myself too, but this is um, like early action script in Flash um, at the moment when um, they switched from, I can't even remember what it was called, was it slash syntax to dot syntax or something like this? I, this is going way, way back. This is obsolete technology. Um, but there is something about this, um, the way that ActionScript is structured that really was about elegance. And I remember thinking about, you know, um, the idea of, also the idea of work in that sense and this kind of, um, Protestant work ethic of like needing to, to be simple, undecorative, um, hardworking, that this is what you would expect from your code, but it's also what you know you would expect from your your woman, right? Like that you're you're a good, you're a good girl, you're elegant, you're not, you know, all hussied up, um, you're not speaking out of turn. It's it's a very it's super parallel. Um, way of thinking about code and math as well, certainly. Other thoughts, questions? Well, I don't want to be a piggy, but <laughs> yeah. I think it would be interesting to, if you could tell us just a little about um, sort of like how you got to be this kind of artist. <laughs> Huh. I mean, <laughs> I'm not entirely sure. <laughs> did it come out of uh, art or did it, I mean, you know, oh, 
like, yeah. What, how did, in our words, did, did you take the bar class when you were eight or, you know? <laughs> um, yeah. Okay, that's an interesting um, question. So, I, as a kid, I um, did a lot of sewing, and I think you see a lot of that in my work. Um, and I, um, you know, when I was like in high school, I thought I was going to be a fashion designer. <laughs> and then um, I went to, well, I went and lived in the desert for a couple of years um, and freaked my parents out and, you know, uh, did not become a fashion designer. <laughs> not that they were super thrilled with that idea either. But I went to art school um, and did my, um, my undergraduate at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. And um, while living in the desert, I uh, started working with a dance company. Um, and I had danced you know, ballet as a kid as well. Um, so in some weird, screwed up administrative way, um, I, when I moved in for undergrad to Chicago, I wanted to keep taking dance classes, which were not offered at the art school that I was going to. So I had to strike up a deal where I would take performance art classes and be able to, like, then like someone would sign off on my getting credit for dance classes somewhere else, you know? And that's how I started doing performance art, was like a bargain, basically, um, for credit. Um, but performance art actually ended up being a great way for me to take all of the things that I loved doing and put the, you know, it's like, a, it's wide open, you know, so I could make costumes and I could, you know, play around with dancers, and I could do all of these things. And I, I started working with video, and you know, I could put videos on the stage too. Why not? You know, so it became this like really good catch-all for me. And I think that that's maybe the genesis of the weirdness you see before you. <laughs> Okay, um, well, I've, I've just always been a nerd, and I really liked theory. So when I was an undergrad, I was part of this reading group um, and read a lot of theory, which I totally did not understand. I had no background in it at all, and I, it was basically like, um, like other art students took a lot of drugs, and I read a lot of theory and like came up with these weird visions of, you know, like, Shelling and you know Zizek and who knows you know, um, so I um, yeah <laughs> um, I then um, also at some point it really occurred to me that I should have a little bit more of a foundation. <laughs> so because I had gone to art school, we were just sort of assigned things randomly that. Uh, pertain to a given class, but there was no um, underlying structure. So I kind of had this chip on my shoulder that I wanted to like, A, prove that I could hack it, and B, um, that I, I just wanted to have the background, really. And when I was living in Chicago, I was um, invited to teach a course on video installation. And I, w I mean, at that time I was really, still thinking of myself as a performance artist. And I did performance installations that sometimes had videos in them in this sort of catch-all way I was just talking about. But I had not really, um, I had taken like a couple of video courses maybe. I had no idea what I was doing. But of course I said yes to the teaching opportunity and then just crammed, like just tried to read everything I could get my hands on. And that ended up being, introducing me to media theory when I decided that I wanted more of a background, I went for an MA at NYU in a program that is, it was at the time called Media Ecology. It's now um, just sort of part of the Media Culture and Communications um, uh, Department at NYU. And it's really, it's a theory, like straight up theory program. Um, you don't make anything. You write, you read and you write. And that became a way for me to sort of uh, before, I was really reading a lot and getting a lot of inspiration um, from texts, but I have, um, you know, since I've, I've incorporated writing more and more into my practice, is what I would say. So, not just reading, but also writing.
Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's an unfinished video. <laughs> well, so basically, um, so that's a video that I am still trying to figure out the sound for. So, um, but it is new work and is part of a series of um, four videos where I'm. Um, this one is called Clicks, and I'm trying to think about. Um, embodying big data. So, and this is actually sort of, this is a great tie-in with um, Paige's question because I have been doing a lot of writing on big data and um, thinking about big data and obesity um, as these two kind of epidemics that we're experiencing or en endemic epidemic. Um, and um, I then started thinking about, okay, well, what would this body look like? And I that's my version of a big data fat suit kind of thing. But the gesture, so I'm in there, um, and the, the video is called Clicks. It's about um, the sort of frustration and endless um, like isolation, really, also, of um, constantly generating one's own data body and the sort of swollen excess that becomes difficult to maneuver. So, yeah. So it'll be part of it. Um, there's another red one, and then I'm um, working on a green fat suit as well for two other. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. Um, disorientalism is sort of the obvious place to um, to go for that. Um, I and that's really a, so. That's a collaboration where we are specifically thinking about um, how our bodies are are both gendered and raised, and also class. Um, I think class and gender figure in my own work, but race. You're right. Race probably figures in my personal work less. In disorientalism. Um, we, so, so I, um, the video that I showed um, is an earlier piece, and in that piece we, and in sort of all of the work that we were making around, I, this is probably like, I would say 2005 until um, maybe like 2010, the work that we were doing was kind of like hyper-Asian. Um, so we were these, you know, I mean in that video you can see us with these like crazy geisha dynasty headdress things, you know. Um, and we became increasingly interested in the idea of like, of the, our failure to represent something that we're like trying to represent and we're failing to represent. Um, so we realized that um, we needed to take a more equal opportunity approach to race um, and that if we were going to be Asian, basically all we have to do is show up and we're already Asian, right? Um, so we're, we were doing this, you know, we were doing like yellow face. We, we, we were always performing in yellow face, you know, and it's like, oh, it's over, over represented. represented. Um, so in the food groups, that, um, that series is specifically our attempt to fail at representing other races too, <laughs> not just failing at representing Asianness, but failing at representing um, these five different races. And the way that we chose those, um, the characters in the food groups, um, was that we realized that there was no Asian character, basically, in, at that moment in, um, in like mid-century American mass-produced food. They're the closest thing is geisha, um, geisha canned goods, right? But it's this sort of, it's not a spokes character. It's like a, a very Asian silent silhouette in like the background of the logo, right? 
Um, whereas these other characters are like, hey, has some reasons, you know. Um, so um, that was sort of, that's really our um, our attempt to to branch out and think even more critically about about race, um, and it it makes for uncomfortable um, uncomfortable imagery. You know, there's the Aunt Jemima project that we do. Um, we are in like half yellow face, half black face, and it's. You know that means a lot to perform in blackface, and we were really researching in that the um, the history of um, of minstrel performance um, and this gesture of refusal um, in uh, blackface minstrel performance. That there's a lot of like turning of the back um, in performance. Um, yeah. I think I'm an aspiring tech geek, but I, I'm not there. <laughs> I think of myself as an artist using technology as, as one of the media that I work with. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just curious as to uh, whether you've seen the spike films from her, in which her hand falls in love with the personified interface of the smartphone. Okay, so I, I'm going to be completely honest. I haven't seen it, but it's um, like everything that I've read about it is amazing. And I've been I've had a very busy semester, <laughs> but yes, that I mean it's totally in all of this work. That that whole narrative is definitely in the work. Yeah, um, there's a great. I'm trying to think of if I can remember it. Um, if you Google, but um, there's a really wonderful piece that's written by um, Karen Gregory about um, about affective labor and. Um, and her, basically. Yeah. Um, so with your work about obsolete technology, how do you think it's going to change because of things going up so much more quicker and like we don't remember everything that comes up with mm -hmm. technology? How would you like to make it small with us, the small bits that get? You know, that's such a great, um, that's a really good question. I mean, I think that that is really, um, that for me is like the urgency of my work. Like you nailed it, you know. I think that um, it's important to address obsolescence because of this acceleration. Um, and I, I don't know how to, I don't know how, you know. All of these are, are my attempts to try, you know, um, all of these projects. But I think that, um, you know, we are both faced with this um, this super accelerated obsolescence cycle um, with objects, but also you know it it sets up um, a way of relating to ourselves. It, it's basically you know it's like um, uh, historical uh, memory lapse kind of right. Like it's it's our our inability as a culture to retain. Um, a sense of history. Right. Sorry, I know that's, that's not an answer, but I don't know the answer. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you.